Conesty, how are ye? Welcome to the Candle Tales podcast. Another episode on waterways and mythic places, as today Surik is going to be telling us the story of how Loch Derg got its name. It's a lake on the shore of the Shannon, and this is one of the versions of one of the many stories, mostly about blood. If you haven't gone to patreon.com forward slash Candle Tales, pop on over there to show your support, or sit back and enjoy this story. Hey Surik, tell us the story, will you? There once was a poet of Ulster, a satirist called Aherne. Aherne was a great satirist, incredibly talented, incredibly skilled with words. He could turn the words around on anyone and no one could answer him. Even in his mother's womb, Aherne was a powerful satirist. She went into an alehouse once and felt the child inside her leap at the smell of ale. But the barman wouldn't serve a pregnant woman. And so the child inside the womb, who would be Aherna, the satirist, cried out and spoke so fierce a satire that the staves of all the barrels burst and the inn was flooded with ale. And his mother managed to swallow three mouthfuls. When Aherna was born, and Aherna grew up, and Aherna's talent grew with him, he became famous, both for his talent and for his greed and for his stinginess. He demanded generosity wherever he went. He would go to the house of a king whose wife had just given birth and demand to sleep with the queen that night. And if he was refused, he could bring ruin on that king. Sometimes with his own words alone, but other times he would go out into the world seeking grievances to bring back to Ulster, to Crahor MacNessa and the Cray of Rua, to give them cause to go to war over some petty slight, because he was a poet. And he had to be appeased. And he had to be protected. There were only three times when Aherna's greed met its match. There was the Leinster woman, Duanach, and she was so rich and so generous that no matter what outlandish thing he asked for, she gave it with a smile, without even knowing that she was involved in a game with Aherna. And even he was satisfied with her boundless generosity. There was his pupil, Amorgan, who he had taught himself, and in whose house he stayed and was persuaded to stay for a whole year. Amorgan was able to outdo Aherna at words and at wits, and so escape his satire and appease him with great food and feasts. The third time Aherna's greed was thwarted by being fulfilled was when he went to visit the king with one eye. The one-eyed king of Connacht, Ochi Maglokta, Ochi was known as a good and a generous king, but Arno was spoiling for a fight. Not a fight that he would fight, but a fight that the Crave Rue would fight on his behalf. And so he was looking for a king to insult him. He was looking for a way to be thwarted. He was looking for a gift he could ask for that no sane or reasonable man would give him so that he could go back to Coror Magnessa and say he had been shamed and disgraced and refused and bring the red branch against them. It didn't much matter to Aherna who it was, but a king in Connacht was always a soft target for Coror Magnessa's ire, and so to Connacht he went. Now the one-eyed king, Ochi, and all his people knew Aherna by reputation. They knew the fierceness of his satire. They knew his terrible humour. 
They knew, when they saw him coming, that there was danger ahead. And the king also knew that they had not the might to stand up against the Crave Ruhr, and that he had not the wealth to satiate the endless appetite of Aherna. And so he feared. He feared for his people. Now, it could not be said of Aherna that he was not good at what he did. He was an excellent poet. And coming into Oki's house, he was given the chance to perform, and perform he did. And he was stunning. He was brilliant. He was witty. And he was cutting. And when the performance came to an end, Oki said to him, You may ask me for any gift. Any gift you name in my power to give you, I'll give you. And Aherna looked the one-eyed king in his one eye. And he said, I want you to put your eye into the palm of my hand. And King Ohi did not hesitate for a moment. With his own finger, he plucked his one remaining eye out of his head and put it into the palm of the poet's hand. And with that, the poet left. The king's servant brought him a basin of water to wash his eye socket with, gushing with blood as it was. And as he bathed his wound, the king would have wept if he'd eyes to weep, but he could not see. The servant remarked to him how the water was turning red, and Oki told him to pour that water out into the lake. So it was done. And Ochi knew he could not keep the kingship, not blind now as he was. And he had a servant lead him outside to the shore of the lake, the lake that was in his kingdom. And he stood and he let the cold breeze and the damp air blow against his face, against the heat of that fresh wound. grieving for what he had lost and what Arna the poet had taken from him. And he was standing there that King Ochi saw the water before him turning red, stained with his own blood, his own generosity. And as he blinked back his surprise He realized not only his eye, but both of his eyes were restored to him. The generosity of kings. And he did not know who it was. What God, what spirit, what power had restored his sight to him. All he knew was that the greatest virtue of a king was generosity. For generosity given was always returned. 